Um, thank you so much for having me. This is my first visit to Japan, and so um, I wanted to say greetings to the Earthlings here in Tokyo. And are we going to dim the lights a little bit? Um, should we turn those off? So I'm, I'm here as the Geological Society of America uh, lecturer, and um, this has taken me, this particular lecture tour has taken me all over uh, the world to places I've never been. I was on a two-month trip where I went to India, uh, New Zealand, and Australia, and then you're the start of my second trip, uh, which is here in Japan, and then I'll be going to uh, China. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a perspective. I, um, I haven't come quite halfway around the world, but maybe about a third. Uh, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, and you can see its location here, and um, I'm visiting you here. If you've ever been to Salt Lake City, it was the home of the 2002 Winter Olympics, and so you can see the Wasatch Mountains that are in the background. Um, the University of Utah uh, is in Salt Lake City, and these are some of, this is the stadium that they built for the Olympic opening and closing ceremonies um, during the Winter Olympics. And I do want to acknowledge all these um, supporting uh, organizations, and I really appreciate this support to uh, come and visit you. So today I'm going to talk about four different aspects. Number one, I want to talk about our perceptions of Mars. Um, secondly, I want to talk about how we use different examples on Earth to help us better interpret the geology of Mars. And the third aspect I want to talk about are some of the NASA missions that are going on. And then the fourth topic is what's going to happen in the future and why should we care? So first of all, we'll start with what are your um, mental perceptions or your ideas of Mars. If you're somebody that's young, you might think of this when you hear the word Mars. Um, this particular candy bar is not so easy to get in the U.S., but um, it is actually made in Australia, so it was very popular there. As you get older, um, and when I was a kid, I watched this particular show, My Favorite Martian, and I kind of thought maybe Martians had these antennas that came out of their head. Um, and then maybe as you get older and you get more information, you start thinking about Mars in terms of science fiction. And I, I think one of the fun aspects of science fiction is that it almost seems like it really could be possible because it is using some facts that we do know um, about Mars. But one of the driving questions is, are we alone in the universe? Is there the possibility of life elsewhere uh, out there? And so this has really uh, fueled some of the interest, particularly recently, in trying to understand more about the relationships between um, the planet and, and perhaps life. So we already know uh, some basic facts about Mars, that it's smaller than Earth, and that because it's farther from the sun, it takes longer to rotate around. So it's a, a year is about 686 Earth days. We also know that its atmosphere is different than Earth's atmosphere. It's very thin and rich in CO2, and that right now Mars' surface is very cold and dry. Um, but maybe it hasn't always been that way. And many of our interpretations are influenced by what data are available to us at the time. So when we look back in the 1960s, the very first visitors to Mars were the Mariner probes. And these are the kinds of images that scientists had to make interpretations. So what kind of geology can you, you know, interpret from looking at these images? You can see some of the basic craters, but you know, today's generation would look at those images and say, those are really too low resolution to do anything with, or you would say, you know, somebody needs to focus those uh, images. They were pretty grainy, and so it was hard to do science then. Um, Another example is uh, a popular image was this one here that was called the face of Mars. And you can see that as the resolution of data got better over time, people recognized that it wasn't really an extraterrestrial face sticking out of the landscape, but that it was just a natural landform. And it was just some of the shadows at the low resolution that made it look a little bit like a face. So largely what you can see is that um, the data that we have available to us has been increasing in resolution over time. 
So here I've plotted up the years from about the 1970s up to the present, and you can see the spatial sampling. Earth data is shown in blue, and the corresponding Mars data is shown in red. And so what you see is that over time, the resolution of data is getting better and better. And so uh, back in the 1960s and 70s, um, the scientists could only recognize features that were about the size of a house. But now the data resolution is so good that, that they can, even from satellite imagery, recognize features that are about the size of a piece of paper, where one pixel is equal to 30 centimeters. And then, of course, some of the data is even better because the rovers are on the ground and they can get resolution that's even down to the submillimeter uh, type of level. So a lot of our perceptions of Mars is changing because the data resolution has increased. So now we're in a new era for Mars exploration. So we have much more data, we have better resolution, and that's affecting the kind of scientific findings that we're getting. So you can see the early rover, Sojourner, was fairly small. And as some of my colleagues have said, this was kind of like the McDonald's era, where it was faster, cheaper, and better, and that meant it was smaller. And then you can see the next generation, um, the Mars Exploration Rover's uh, Opportunity and Spirit were larger. And the current um, Mars Science Laboratory rover, Curiosity, is much larger. This is one that's about the size of a small Mini Cooper, or a small car. And so this has much more uh, instrumentation and a bigger payload so that it can do even more scientific analyses than were possible with these earlier versions. So really what's happened is over time, our perception of Mars has changed from thinking that Mars was a basaltic type of planet, just a little bit more redder than the moon perhaps, um, to now re realizing that Mars is a planet that has a much different history and that in fact there are many sedimentary layers on Mars that are telling us a history about past waters. And so this has been a very large jump in how we have perceived uh, Mars. And so to show you an example of how we use analogs or how we would use different examples, I have um, an analog of the rock cycle. And I think everybody is familiar with the three types of rocks, igneous rocks that might be like this, that are very fresh and pristine and form at high temperatures. And then sometimes uh, these kinds of grains um, get squashed and they are subjected to high pressure like these metamorphic grains. Okay, so this is just an analog to kind of show you how um, these would be related to how cars are related to different types of grains, and many of us can relate to cars. Um, and then sedimentary grains would be like these old beat up Volkswagen. Um, these are ones that have traveled maybe around the world many times, and part of the challenge of sedimentary grains is figuring out what is the history. Where have those grains been? Where have they traveled? And what's happened to them over time? And it turns out that one of the aspects that I'm interested in is what we call diagenesis. Diagenesis are the secondary or the post-depositional changes that have happened after the grains have come to rest. So you see here on, the, um, on these cars, these VWs, there's some moss growing on here. So that would be analogous to diagenesis, something that happens after the grains have come to rest. So science is really kind of serendipitous, and that's one of the things that makes it so much fun. Um, so I had been working on some of these areas in Utah. I had been looking at why sandstones are different colors, and that's related to diagenesis, how fluids have moved through the rock. And as I was uh, out on a field trip, I was leading, um, there were some planetary scientists, and we stopped at this particular outcrop because it was close to an impact site that they wanted to see. And one of the scientists, uh, planetary scientists said to me, have you ever thought about s some of this concretionary iron as being an explanation for some of the hematite on Mars? And at that time, people had been thinking hematite on Mars might be in these layers somewhat like the banded iron formation. And the interesting thing is I said, you know, I have never really even thought about Mars 
um, but let's work on it together. So we started collaborating, and uh, when we got together, we started thinking that this explanation might be a much better explanation for some of the hematite on Mars than what people had been previously thinking. And so this was really an exciting point in my career because I started getting more interested in Mars. And um, when we later uh, sent the Opportunity rover um, to Meridiana Planum, uh, it turned out that some of the data that came back indicated that some of the iron might in fact be diagenetic. And so that was just serendipitous and for me really exciting. So the story I want to tell you today is about how some of the examples from Utah might be used to try to help explain some of the examples on Mars. And what concept we're going to focus on is that many of the rocks are color-coded. And the colors mean something about the mineralogy, and then that tells us something um, specific about the composition of the fluids that have moved through. And many of the different colors that we see reflected in some of these kinds of sandstones reflect how iron has moved through the Earth's crust. And many of these colors are um, from the iron, as though Mother Nature or um, the artistry of nature is, is in the iron coloration. And you can also see some of these um, examples of concretions, these cemented mineral masses, are also different colors, and these are reflecting different minerals. So we have iron oxide minerals, these are malachite, and these are azurite. And so we can use both these colors as well as these concretionary masses as records or proxies to how fluids have moved through the rock. And then what we want to do is use that to interpret some of the history of Mars. So the main two minerals that I'm going to be focusing on are hematite, which is Fe203, often sort of a silverish, uh, silvery looking color when it's crystalline, and then um, a reddish color uh, when it's ground up as opposed to this gray color. And then guthite, which is Feooh, uh, which is more of a yellowish brown type of color. And these together make up iron oxides. So concretions are these cemented mineral masses, and they can be a wide variety of compositions, but one common variety is made up of these iron oxide uh, minerals. And many of these weather out of the outcrop, and then they are let down onto a surface, a deflation surface, where they tend to accumulate. So the areas in Utah are mostly in the south, and this is an area that's part of what we call the Colorado Plateau that's centered right at the four corners of these states. And this is an area where the rocks are very well exposed. These sedimentary layers are horizontal. They haven't had much tectonic alteration, and so they're an ideal place to look at sedimentary relationships. And in this area, you can see some of these different layers. And of all the rock units that are on the Colorado Plateau, the one unit that has the greatest porosity and permeability is the Navajo sandstone, the Jurassic Navajo sandstone, you know, from the time of the dinosaurs. And this particular unit um, is the unit that also contains the greatest variety of concretions because of that porosity and permeability and how fluids have moved through the rock. If you could go back in time, to the Jurassic. Here's the state of Utah here. This whole area was covered by an ancient desert, um, and this is an erg that includes some of the nugget formation up here in Wyoming, a lot of the Navajo sandstone that covers Utah, and part of the Aztec sandstone that covers um, southern Nevada. So this was the largest erg uh, in, preserved in the geologic record. Now the model that we've come up with for coloration from looking at many examples is a three-step model where probably these uh, sedimentary grains get a very thin film of hematite or iron oxide coating very early in its history. And it's a very thin film where maybe of the total rock only a half a percent is that iron, but a little bit of iron goes a long way to making this red colored. And then when these sediments are buried in the subsurface, fluids come through and bleach the sandstone white, 
putting the iron into solution. And then when this iron that's in solution meets with oxygenated groundwater, it causes the reprecipitation of the iron into these cemented mineral masses that we call concretions. When you look at how concretions form, you can see this formula of iron plus oxygen in the presence of water is going to produce hematite with maybe a little bit of leftover hydrogen that produces a little bit of acidity. So essentially, as you're driving this reaction towards the right, you might be going across the stability fields between hematite and also producing um, a little bit of acidity. And this change here is reflected in the pH and maybe some of the oxidizing conditions that might give you some of this subtle banding that is uh, very commonly associated with these concretions. Now, part of the story about bleaching um, is reflected in these reducing fluids that come through and bleach the sandstone white. So these could be things like petroleum, um, it could be methane, and it could also, some of the bleaching could be attributed to organic acids. So you can see this outcrop here of red sandstone, and right in the middle there's a tar sand that has oil locked up in the pores, which gives it the gray color. And then on either side, you can see the yellow coloration, which shows the bleaching of some of the original red color. You can also see that right here, there was a root or a rhizolith, and that probably also made a locally reducing environment, which is why the sandstone is so white right here. And you can see that fluids are very particular about where they're going to go, and that's partially a function of what fluid pathways are where the porosity is the best. So in this cross-bedded sandstone, you can see that the upper parts that are coarser grained are bleached white, but down here at the bottom or the toe of the dune, that's where there's more clay, and that retains some of that red coloration. Here are some joints right here, and you can see how fluids have moved out from the joints, bleached the sandstone white, but didn't quite bleach or reach that interior portion. And here's an example of a fault, and you can see how fluids have come up along that fault and also bleach the sandstone. So the basic model is starting off with a red sandstone fairly early in the history, reducing waters come through, and they bleach the sandstone white and put the iron into solution so that this water is saturated with Fe2+. Then when you introduce oxygenated groundwater, the mixing of those can cause the reprecipitation of the iron into these cemented mineral masses that we call these concretions. And these can have a, a self-organized uh, type of spacing. So you might wonder, why are these oftentimes a sphere? Well, it turns out that a sphere is the minimum free energy shape. It takes the least amount of energy to form a sphere, and it takes more energy to form something like a cube. So this shape is the one that's the most common. Sometimes you can get shapes that are like a flying saucer, where they're kind of stretched out across here. And if you look very carefully on the inside of these, you can see that this lamina right here is slightly coarser grained than the lamina at the top and the bottom. So what that means is that the iron diffuses faster along this lamina, which is why this particular concretion has that very pronounced ridge. The inside of these concretions don't seem to show a nucleus like some other types of concretions. So you can see this one here we, where we have almost kind of this uh, CAT scan of the inside. There's no physical nucleus, but it is possible that there could have been a chemical nucleus that later got consumed in uh, the chemical reactions. So we also know that cementation can occur fairly quickly. So here's a pocket knife that's probably only 100 years old, and you can see that the knife blade was the source of the iron and that there was preferential cementation around that source of the knife blade. So one of the important things about concretions is that it's often hard to tell when they um, were precipitated, but there are examples showing that they can be fairly young. So you can see here, in these outcrop exposures, the spheres are very common, and they get let down onto these surfaces. 
And in this particular image, you can see the um, concretions have been accu accumulating on this flat surface. Um, and there, all this gray area that's behind my sun are these uh, millions of concretions that are all about a half a centimeter or uh, less in diameter. And I brought some examples here. Uh, many of these kinds of sizes are fairly close to some of the features that I'm going to show you um, on Mars. There are also other types of forms. Sometimes the concretionary forms can be like these sheets that almost seem to cut across some of the cross bedding. Other times they have forms that look like pipes going in and out of the outcrop. And yet other times you can find ones that have these shapes that look like a cinder block. <coughs> Excuse me. These are areas where there's conjugate joint sets and it looks like fluids have moved up along those joint sets and preferentially cemented them so they look a, a little bit like blocks. <coughs> so what does all this have to do with Mars? Um, the rover Opportunity was sent to this area here at Meridiana Planum and this was an area that they knew contained crystalline hematite from some of the spectral imaging. And so one of the reasons why the rover was sent here um, in 2004 was because this was an area they suspected um, might have iron that's deposited by fluids. And um, what we're going to see is that some of the forms actually indicated that these were um, proxy records of past groundwaters and some of the host rock properties that are exhibited. So the uh, rover Opportunity um, was sent to this area here. It landed at this spot right here, and it landed in a small crater. And for those of you that play golf, um, if you get a good shot, I think it's called an eagle. And so the rover balloon um, landed here and kind of bounced into a small crater, and so they called this eagle crater. And here you can see some of the very earliest images where you can see some of the outcrops along the crater edge. And this particular image shows the thermal emission spectroscopy that's superimposed on the outcrop image. So this coloration of red shows high amounts of iron. This area where it's white or colorless are low amounts of iron. And then these other colors represent intermediate amounts of iron. And this area is where the rover balloon bounced and pushed some of the hematite um, into the Martian soil. So you can see that this distribution of iron is fairly similar to these kinds of distributions that we see in the outcrop. This would be low amounts of iron um, in the areas of southern Utah. This would be areas of high amounts of iron that would be similar to this area that's shown by the red coloration. Now, one of the very important observations, and I think one of the things that was so surprising to people, is that when they uh, saw the occurrence of the iron, it wasn't in these nice layers like they were expecting. But in fact, the iron seemed to be bound up into these small um, spherules. And these spherules were small. And if you could see them with your naked eye, they might look like this gray color. Um, so they called them blueberries. Uh, because they were approximately that size. And also in outcrop, what you'll see is that they were physically spaced out almost like blueberries in a muffin. And here you can see the false color of yellow that's superimposed on this to show a little bit more clearly where the spherules are in relationship to the outcrop. So what you see is that these are physically spaced out here and the grains aren't touching each other. And that's an important observation because under normal hydrodynamic conditions, the grains would usually be touching each other. But this physical spacing is an indicator that these could be concretions. And you can see the examples from Earth on the right. You can see the physical spacing or the self-organization where the concretions are not touching each other, but they're physically dispersed. So that was a very important observation for making the interpretation that these might be concretions and deposited by groundwater flow. What we see from some of the Earth examples is that when you look at these concretions in a chemical reaction front, and this is a little bit similar to something like the uranium roll front model, but it's uh, slightly different conditions. 
But what you see is that the concretions along the reaction front are small, and uh, where they're small, they're close together, but where they're larger, they're physically um, more spaced apart. And so you can see the same type of relationship. Small concretions are close together. Bigger concretions are farther apart. Is that from Mars or this, uh, this example is from Earth. These are just examples that we've <coughs> measured. Yes. Um, and some other interesting examples were uh, based on the morphology. So the Mars pictures are shown here in the left in black and white, and the Earth pictures are here on the right. So here you can see some of the bedding of the sandstone, the basaltic sandstone on Mars. And you can see one spherule that's poking its head out here. And you can see, if you look very carefully, that there's a ridge on that spherule. And that ridge is very similar to the ridge on this type of concretion here, which is telling us something about the difference in the permeability along these layers. Another thing that was surprising to people were the conjoined forms. And so they found doublets, which are two, like twins, stuck together, and also ones that are these triplets. And you can see that from some of the Earth examples, we can have many different kinds of forms, some that are the singles, but doublets or uh, twins are very common, and triplets of three are also very common. And sometimes people have asked me, why were the um, triplets on Mars aligned like a snowman and the triplets on Earth look like Mickey Mouse ears? Well, we do uh, have some that also are in this shape. Um, so you can see that there's a wide range of um, forms, even some that look like these clusters here. So these show some of the different sizes of concretions on Earth. Some are the size of golf balls, about five centimeters, and some go all the way down to these very small sizes. And many of these small sizes here are about the size of the concrete the concretions or the blueberries that they found on Mars. And I brought some examples that you can uh, come up and take a look at here, um, some of these iron oxide ones that are from Utah. Some other things that were important to establish is uh, what exactly is the composition of those spherules? And was the iron or the hematite really just in the spherules themselves? So what the uh, Mars team did was they found a place where these uh, blueberries had actually accumulated in a small depression. And they called that the, the berry bowl. And so at that place where they were close together, they ran the Mossbauer instrument. And the Mossbauer instrument is very good at detecting iron phases. And it had a very characteristic six peaks here that indicate the composition of hematite. So they knew that these were made of the mineral uh, hematite. Um, these uh, concretions um, here also show some similar mineralogies. They range from hematite, um, but some also contain guthite. And then the uh, Mars examples here show some of the interiors where they use the rock abrasion tool to grind down and to see what these spherules look like on the inside. And you can see that they mostly look like they're relatively solid, similar to some of these examples. Now, one of the things that's important to recognize is that there is a lot of variation on Earth that we didn't see on Mars. And so this particular uh, outcrop shows some of these concretions. And it's hard um, to get an idea of the scale. But this is one of my favorite pictures. These concretions here are all about the size of a grapefruit, all about that big. And they all have a kind of bumpy exterior, kind of like an avocado. But many of these reaction fronts will produce concretions that are all about the same size. And so one of the questions is, um, why are some of the concretions on Earth uh, so different and have so much of a range of variety um, compared to the examples on Mars? And you have to recognize that even though I'm talking about these as an analog, it's not a perfect analog. Not everything about the Earth examples is exactly the same on Mars. And Mars probably has its own unique chemistry. But one of the things I think is very important about Earth, and maybe one of the reasons why 
there are so many different types and so many different varieties is because literally all the waters on Earth are contaminated with life. And probably ever since the Precambrian, you, you couldn't find water that didn't have or doesn't have microbial life in it. So um, I would kind of assert that here on Earth, it might be even very difficult for us to know what, what would abiotic products look like. What would concretions look like if they didn't have life involved? I'm, I think it might be very difficult for us to tell because so much of uh, the Earth and its systems contain water. And that water often contains life. So one thing that um, was interesting is that uh, many people asked me fairly early on as the um, rovers were exploring, why haven't the rovers found more sizes of concretions when there's so many different sizes on Earth? And I said, well, the rovers have only been to one place, and I think as they explore around, they'll find more sizes. And within two weeks of saying that, um, they did find another size, and that size was what they call these microberries, ones that were only about a millimeter in size, about the size uh, of a head of a pin. And um, we find that these small sizes are actually the most common sizes that we have on Earth. And oftentimes, you can see examples here on Earth that compare almost uh, exactly to the way these microberries looked on Mars. And you can see that because they're so small, they get reworked by wind into these ripple forms. And so it's like coarse sand. And here are some of the microconcretions on Earth that are worked into these ripples. And here's the ripple cross section. Uh, here's an example from Mars where these microberries also seem to be reworked into ripple forms. Another thing that was interesting is I showed you some different examples from Earth that often seem to show a Rhine type of structure. And so many people said, why do those uh, examples from Earth often show these Rhines and we only see solid forms on Mars? Well, one of the uh, recent images from 2002 did show some of these forms on Mars that seem to show uh, a Rhine. They don't know exactly what the composition is because some of the instruments have degraded over time and they can't uh, tell the mineralogy as precisely. But you can see that some of these features look still very similar to some of the varieties that we have here on Earth. In thinking about some of the compositions of uh, the fluids, uh, people have been looking at different types of modern analogs. What are the kinds of settings on Earth in modern environments that might have some of these same kinds of mineralogies uh, that produce halite, gypsum, iron oxides, and this mineral jarosite that was recognized by the rover. And it turns out that some of these acid lakes in Western Australia seem to be a good analog for some of the chemical types of settings where the acidity is around a pH of 2 to 4. And you can see that um, these produce some of the same types of mineralogies that were recognized in association with um, some of the concretions. And there do seem to be some forms that might be possible concretions in within some of the sediments uh, deposited here in Western Australia. So the real big question is, is there life on Mars? Um, we found um, evidence of past waters, and does that mean that there's life? It's probably not going to be like Marvin the Martian here, but we do know that rocks are very good at recording life. And on Earth, we can record everything from uh, microbial life and blue-green algae all the way up to things like dinosaurs. And one of the aspects that scientists are looking more carefully at are biosignatures. Is there evidence that uh, biological or microbial life has been involved in the precipitation of certain minerals? And so here's an example of an opiomorpha burrow. This would be like a ghost shrimp. And you can see that it's in a bleached sandstone, but the burrow itself is cemented with the iron oxides. And so why, why is this area preferentially cemented with the iron oxides? Well, there might be some microbes that were there in the burrow structure that were preferentially attracting the iron, and maybe that's a reason why this is um, so well cemented. 
So to explore that a little bit further, um, I want to discuss another project that I've been working on with one of my colleagues who is a vertebrate paleontologist. And uh, my colleague Randy Ermis had been looking at the Chin Li formation, which is Triassic in age, in New Mexico. And they had been digging for dinosaur bones in this quarry here. And one of the things that they noticed is that in the layers that had the dinosaur bones, they also found concretions. And there was such a close relationship that when they saw concretions, they knew that they were going to find dinosaur bones. And as they found and extracted some of these bones, there's an example right here, one of the things that was uh, very intriguing is that some of the bones showed that the concretions were at the ends of the bones, like right here and one that's attached right here. So why would the concretions be on the ends of the bones? Well, one of the ideas that we're hoping to test is that maybe originally the bones still had some soft tissue that was left on the ends where, you know, there would have been um, tissue that would have held some of the bones together. And maybe some of that tissue there, the original organics, was enough to be a nucleation site for some of the precipitation of uh, these minerals. So what I want to, you know, assert to you is that there seems to be a very close relationship between life and some of the geochemical reactions that happen. And I think that relationship is a very important one that needs to be further explored. So there are more mysteries that are on the horizon. And if I were to look into my crystal ball, it would look something like this. This is, uh, I think, the largest um, iron oxide concretion that I've ever come across. Um, this one is about the size of a beach ball. So it's about 82 um, centimeters across. And what's so remarkable is that even though it's so big, it's almost perfectly spherical. And I don't really know how that formed. Um, it's really a mystery to me. Uh, my son is standing on it here. Um, but I think it's telling us something about the complex history of how fluids have flowed through these sedimentary layers. And in this particular example, it's, it's actually out of the Cretaceous. And you can see several of these large concretions here. Why did they get so big? Um, you know, is it the convergence of multiple factors that are coming together? And is it possible that microbial life uh, might be involved in the waters? I think those are um, stories that uh, I'm interested in investigating further. And, and I think that it'll tell us more about fluid flow um, that maybe we haven't realized in the past. So the lessons that we learn out of looking at these red rock areas in Utah are that the iron is uh, an indicator of where fluids have been in the past and what some of their pathways have been. When you see the different colors, if it's a very even red color, it's probably some of the original early diagenetic red. And then if it's white, it's often probably been bleached where the iron has been removed and mobilized. And then where you have dark, splotchy, or patchy areas, that may be the places where the iron has been re-precipitated into these concretions that you see here. And for the red planet Mars, what we're doing is using these examples on Earth to help us interpret the idea that there has been past groundwater fluid flow on Mars. And so these spherules here are being interpreted as concretions. So that's telling us that there's been a watery history. And because there's been past waters, this leads to the idea that maybe there are habitable environments for life uh, because of this past history of water. So what I find fascinating is that earth science is an area where we use what we know from all of our experiences. We can look at examples on Earth that tell us something about different boundary conditions. And we have a lot of variety. We can look at uh, four dimensions because we have control on time. And we have this aspect of life that's very much bound up in our planet. If we uh, look at planetary science, what we can start to do is use our Earth experience to help us refine where we should look on um, Mars, what some of the past processes are, and we can really start to decipher the sedimentary record by using some of these analog examples and maybe use it to 
help us do a better job of exploring and predicting where we might expect to see certain types of features. So really we're in an era where there's been more integration between Earth and planetary science. And these two sciences that used to be farther apart are now really merging together more. And one field that's been very popular is astrobiology, really looking at the potential for extraterrestrial life and looking at the origins of how life developed. Now the third aspect that I mentioned I was going to talk about were the NASA missions. These show all the different areas of the past missions and the current mission is at Gale Crater where the Mars Science Laboratory uh, rover Curiosity is. And I was fortunate to be able to attend the launch of Curiosity. So this was the day before where you can see the rocket um, that was poised here for takeoff. And we got a little bit of a tour and got to take this picture. And then the next morning we got up early and they put us on buses and took us to a parking lot that was about um, five kilometers away from the site. And you have to be far enough away that um, you won't have hearing damage or you won't have any debris that falls on you. Um, so we waited two hours for the rocket to take off. And I have to say that um, even though it was only about 10 seconds long, <laughs> because you count down 10, 9, 8, you know, it was actually one of the most exciting 10 seconds that I can ever remember. And um, when you're there in person, it's uh, very impressive because it's loud and it's very bright. And when you're there with other people that have a vested interest in it, it's just really exciting. And I find that it's amazing that, that these missions have been so successful. Um, so the mission of Curiosity is um, a mission that is supposed to be, quote, guaranteed for 23 months. Um, this particular rover, Curiosity, I mentioned is much larger. It's got lots of lasers and spectrometers. And because of its payload, it moves more slowly. So it takes a long time um, to get to where it's supposed to go. But Curiosity is headed to this area, which is um, Mount Sharp. And it wants to look at um, and image these sedimentary layers. And what is it looking for? It's looking for habitable environments, places where um, there might be life or evidence of life that's been preserved in the rock record. And what's interesting is on the way, it's been finding more nodules or things that are interpreted as possible concretions. And also it's found uh, other evidence of past waters. And so here is an example of an area, this ellipse here, where the rover went through and came across some rock that looked like a piece of concrete turned up on edge. And as it looked at, um, as the rover imaged uh, this particular outcrop, um, it showed uh, these areas here. This is Mars on the left and Earth on the right. And you can see that this is a conglomerate. And the conglomerate shows rounded grains. And these grains can only get this kind of rounding, as far as we know, from moving water. And so the interpretation is that it shows these similarities to conglomerates here on Earth, and that these would have been moved and shaped by surface water conditions. So one of the things that we often ask ourselves in the United States is, is all this money that we're spending on these missions worth it? So this is $2.5 billion for the Mars Science Laboratory mission. That includes eight years of preparation and the 23 months of the mission that the, the rover is supposed to last for. And so that turns out to be about $312 million a year for this time. And if you take the population of the US, that averages out to about a dollar per person per year. And that's still including the, the price of the rocket and the salaries of all the scientists and engineers. So is that uh, too much money to spend? Um, well, what we want to do is take another example of uh, how we spend our money in the US on rovers. And, and by the way, um, one of the most popular names for a pet dog in the US is Rover. So we're going to compare different rovers. And in the US, um, in 2011, we spent $50 billion a year on pets, 
which averages out to $160 per person per year. So this rover up here at the top is a very good deal at a dollar per person versus this rover down here, even though this rover is, is very cuddly and friendly. So um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is what's going to happen in the future. Why should we care about Mars? Or, or does this really matter? When I think if you look at these um, images from the high rise, you see these spectacular features. And you think, you know, this, this is really interesting. These are dust devil tracks that show that the surface of Mars is still being shaped. I think one of the uh, exciting parts about the missions to Mars is that it is all about science. And it's pushing us forward in new ways that's stretching our knowledge. And here you can see some fabulous dune forms here. Um, this is an opportunity for us to push our knowledge in ways that we haven't been able to do before, in part because we didn't have the resolution that we currently have. And so this is exciting for people of all generations. Um, you can see uh, this person here who's one of the NASA uh, engineers. He usually gets a special haircut for some of the landings, and um, he was known as the Mohawk guy. And even President Obama knew who he was. Um, but really, it takes all kinds of people um, to do these types of missions, and it really gives us a perspective of who we are in the universe. It also turns out that as we do these explorations, there's often different innovations that happen, and there are benefits to society. So these can be things like Teflon products or better computer games or better um, cyber infrastructure that are partly a result of some of these types of missions. So there are societal benefits, and now seems to be a very good window of opportunity where we can advance um, our science because of the technology that we have. So what I find is that this is a really fun uh, merging of both Earth and planetary science, and that many of these areas, such as this um, image of the South Pole of Mars, have these features that we don't perhaps have a good analog for on Earth. And some of these are called spiders because they look like uh, legs of a spider. And these kinds of features are things to explore. And the frontier of this really kind of unites different countries and gives us uh, things to look forward to, um, gives us dreams of what might be possible in the future. And so even as I go to meetings, I sense, I feel that sense of excitement from people of all different countries. And I think the aspect that's really exciting is what is going to happen in the future. I think that's for um, some of you young people that might be here. You are the next generation. And you'll get to explore uh, Mars and as well as other planetary bodies in ways that many of us have never had that opportunity uh, to do before. And in many cases, the examples that we have here on Earth, the geology that we do here will actually help us be able to do a better uh, job of exploring in the future. So that's my uh, story about uh, Earth analogs to Mars. And I thank you very much for listening and, and being here. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A very interesting, a very impressive lecture. OK, so now our lecture is open to questions and comments. Please. <laughs> Uh, Marjorie, I've always wanted to ask you this question about the Milky Marbles, or the concretions in the Navajo, uh -huh. in the Martian ones. Because uh, after the blueberries were um, uh, reported, uh, I took a group of Caltech students out to uh, the Navajo Sandstone. We collected hundreds of those little marbles. It was mainly on the western side from the Navajo. But we didn't find any hematite at all in them. And you know, we know from the moss flower spectrum that there were hematite in the Martian ones. So we've been scratching our heads and wondering why some of these can form without any, you know, I mean, their the magnetic remnants were zero. And uh, I'm just curious, is there a process in Mars over four billion years that would take the non-magnetic iron oxyhydroxides, limonite and things and graphites, mm -hmm. and convert that into hematite? Well, hematite is, is a more stable form. So um, over time, 
you know, things can actually, if you have more um, metamorphism or you have other kinds of conditions over time, you can get to the, that more stable form. And one thing that um, one of my colleagues had found that I think it was uh, University of Oklahoma, that in some cases when they froze some of the iron oxides, it would actually convert to hematite. Oh, um, and so I thought that was kind of a, an interesting idea. But there are some concretions here on Earth that are hematite. Most of the ones that you found are a good fight. Yeah. Um, but some, some do have the hematite. And <coughs> just well, I'm actually not sure of Gerdite, because Gerdite has a spin defect and ferromagnetic remnants. These things have nothing. It was mm -hmm. kind of like a very hydride or a limonite yeah. of some sort. Right. Um, and, and some, yeah, we did feel were very hydrates. So. Uh, Do you think it's plausible on Mars maybe the freezing cycles would convert them into an eventual? I, I think it's possible, but I, I don't think, um, you know, when I show these particular examples, it doesn't bother me that the mineralogies aren't exactly the same. To me, it's more the process of how fluids move through the rock, they cement up, and they can be any kinds of compositions. And I brought, you know, I brought some that are the, the blue azurite ones and some that are the malachite. And these examples are occurring along a fault zone where there's copper-rich fluids that are coming up. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a matter, I think, of what the compositions of the fluids are. In the case of the, of the Mars example, there's also so much more iron because of the basaltic composition. Um, and maybe it's some of those other kinds of conditions that are giving rise to the hematite. In the Martian example, uh, do you have any idea of whether there are also uh, non-hematite iron oxides there? I mean, I know the moss bar was picking up the hematite. Yeah. Had more in transition very nicely there. Right. But it wasn't clear, was it a small fraction or a big fraction of the, um, of, uh, of the iron? You know, I, I, I'm not positive. I know Tim Glotch um, had looked quite a bit at some of the iron oxides, and he felt that it was possible that you could have had some precursors, mm -hmm. precursor mineralogies before you, you got to the hematite. But some of these other examples that I showed that had the rind um, types of forms, those are ones that they think are probably not um, as enriched in hematite, but they just don't know exactly what the composition is because they're not able to do the detailed analysis. Yeah. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if they find other compositions. Um, but you know, there, there's still lots of areas to explore there. Thank you. Any other? Thank you. Okay, any other question? Please. Uh, I have a question about uh, timing of uh, formation of uh, hematite concretion. Uh, you said uh, the, uh, some spherical type uh, paper concretion uh, needs uh, some uh, say, uh, longer uh, processes. Cement barrier and the bricks by uh, reductive, reductive uh, fluid and the uh, uh, iron uh, uh, accumulated. So uh, I guess it, uh, it needs uh, some longer time. But uh, how about uh, concretion uh, <coughs> observed in uh, fossil? or uh, Ophimorpha, uh, it needs uh, shorter time uh, to uh, form uh, hematite concretion. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> rule uh, the, uh, I'm not so good at in English. So, so you're asking about um, the timing of the concretions? Yeah, uh, spherical type needs, uh, I guess, spherical type needs uh, longer time. Um, I'm not sure that it needs longer time. I mean, I think probably the smaller ones are, are, are less time, and maybe, you know, something like the bigger one that I was sh showing maybe um, takes more time. Although, I think if the conditions are right, things will just happen quite easily and, and maybe fairly quickly. So the age of the concretions is very difficult to determine. Um, I've been looking at this with one of my colleagues Pete Reiner's from the University of Arizona. And um, we're looking at the uh, 
idea of using uh, uranium, thorium, helium chronometry to try to date these. Um, it's very difficult because you can't use some of the same traditional methods. We did find some um, manganese mineralization that was associated with some of the uh, concretions, concretionary iron. And so the potassium out of the manganese mineral um, cryptomaline could be used to, to get an argon date. Um, and that was about 25 million years. And then from some of the initial analyses that we've done, and, and there will be a paper that will come out in the GSA bulletin, um, some of the dates that we got were as old as 25 million years, but some were very young um, that were maybe, you know, like 0 0.5 uh, million years. And so some things seem to be quite young. Um, so it's hard to know, does that mean uh, that we don't understand the closure temperature of helium or is it just dating the last water that came through? Those are the things that are hard to, to determine because, you know, maybe these things aren't just happening once. Maybe there's multiple waters that come through at different times and, you know, add layers on. It, um, because some of them do seem to show kind of a layered effect. It's, it's really hard to know. And what's fun is that when I first started working on these, there, there wasn't that much interest in these iron oxide concretions, but there has been more interest, and I think we'll be able to do a better job as, as we study these more. So uh, we usually can uh, observe uh, in uh, calcite concretions. Uh, in the calcite concretions, uh, the original thickness of the formation is preserved in the, I would say, uh, shadow is a, uh, very common. So, but, uh, I am, uh, um, so you're saying in the carbonate concretions, mm -hmm. it looks like they often form uh, early and there's uh, sure, the yeah. differential compaction mm -hmm. around the sides. Yeah. Um, we don't see that oh. um, in these examples. But of course, the framework grains are, are it's a quartz aronite. And so it's fairly, you know, resistant to the compaction. But it seems like, you know, that they're probably later. Any questions or comments? Please. Let me ask a question about the mechanism, mechanism, the way how those concretions form. All those concretions on Earth on Mars, do you think all of them require water? Or some of those concretions can form without water? No, by other drive, I don't know, maybe just chemical or just physical, like magnetic, or just gravitation. Um, I don't believe so, but uh, I guess anything is possible. I don't, I don't know of any other mechanism. You know, when we look at these examples on Earth, we know that it has to have water that's precipitating the minerals that are in between the sand grains. And so how could you um, get that same kind of form? Um, and that the other thing that's um, important to recognize are, are some of the subtleties of the features, like the ridges, the ridges that are uh, on the edges. That's saying something about the porosity and the permeability, how fluids have moved through preferentially along some of those layers. And so that's going to happen with the fluid. When I say water, you know, it could be, it could be an acidic water. It's not like necessarily the water that some we're chemistry. drinking. Some yeah, chemistry. Some chemistry, involved. right. I don't think it has to be a magnetic property mm -hmm. because many of these kinds of minerals are not magnetic minerals. You know, they uh, they can be carbonate, they can be, um, you know, the azurite, the malachite, the iron oxides. So you what, think all of them formed by the same way, or similar way? A similar way. Independent of chemistry. Yeah, they're they're different chemistries, which is why they're different mineralogies. But the process, I think, is the same. Do you have some other ideas? Maybe. <laughs> hey, maybe talk to me afterwards. The molten end, ends of lightning bolts that have gone in. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?
Okay, anyway, I have one question. Okay. Usually there's a big conclusion. Yes. Yeah. So, so far the curiosity has found that kind of a large conclusion on Mars. This is small. Uh, Only small? Yeah, on Mars, the only size that they found are usually about a half, half a centimeter, 4.2 millimeters is what the blueberries mostly were. And then the real small ones were one millimeter. Um, so, yeah, so this one on Earth is huge, yeah. yeah. Something different, and I, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm hoping to have a student look at it um, in the next year. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I think it's a very nice and very exciting lecture. So are there any more questions? No more questions? So we should better to move on to the coffee break. About 15 minutes. So I think the starting of this institute prepares a coffee only for a professor and her husband, <laughs> John. Okay, so other participants, please go down to the ground floor to get uh, anything to drink using a vending machine. Right? <laughs> so please come up to this lecture room at 4:20. Anyway, I want to give you one more information. Uh, after Next our lecture, we will have a reception on, on the first floor. First floor, yes. So could you give us uh, some details? Um, uh, uh, there will be a re reception on the first floor after, uh, after the second lecture, and we will serve wine and beer and cheese and crackers and things. So please join us. So please, yeah, on the all of floor. you, attend this uh, reception. But you, if you want to attend, we want to ask you to pay 500 yen? There will be a box, so, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so, so I won't come running after you. Please ask you, right? <laughs> you don't have any coin. Please put uh, one thousand yen. <laughs> yes, I appreciate your donation. The <laughs> okay, so see you in 50 minutes. Okay. Well, thank you for staying. <laughs> um, the second lecture that I'm going to talk about. Um, involves uh, eolian deposits and um, some of the aspects of, of dunes and how they undergo deformation and then of course you know that I'm interested in diagenesis. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about dunes. And um, this work that I'm going to be presenting in particular represents work that I've been doing with different collaborators and some of the work of some of my students. So Aeolian systems are um, more than just a lot of hot air. And what I hope to tell you today is that it's more than just a monotonous pile of sand. And even when I was first doing uh, sedimentology, I thought all Aeolian deposits are the same. You know, just cross-bedded dune sand, it all looks the same. But it's actually quite different. And so what I want to do is um, give you the idea about how the Aeolian systems, even on Earth, have existed for a long period of time throughout geologic time. Um, there have been evidences um, and stories that have been preserved in the rock record of the wind and how it's shaped the Earth's surface. And even on Mars, you can see examples of modern dune forms and some of these dust devil tracks that show how wind is currently resurfacing um, Mars. And the power of wind is really kind of remarkable, from holding up my husband to uh, being an important uh, energy source, to some of these unusual vent effects that we can see on the surface, to even some of these unusual tracks that are in the um, playas of Death Valley, California. And this uh, area that's called the racetrack is where these sometimes uh, big boulders have actually gotten moved out onto this playa um, and presumably have been pushed by the wind as these uh, sediments are, are wet and um, kind of gel-like so that the rocks can actually kind of slide along. So why are we interested in Aeolian deposits? Well, it turns out that many of these are very thick reservoirs in the subsurface and so there are important economic interests we also know that climate signals are often well preserved in continental deposits. And it also turns out that many of these Aeolian deposits record uh, proxies of diagenesis and how fluids have moved through the rock record. 
And I also think one thing that is going to be more important in the future is that even some of these aeolian deposits can be a substrate or a host for life. And I'll show you some examples of that. So I'm going to ask three questions about the uh, records of aeolian deposits. Number one, what is diagenesis like? And in particular, what do the colors tell us? Um, how do hydrocarbons influence the color? And, and how might that affect our exploration techniques and approaches? Number two, does soft sediment deformation occur in aeolian deposits? And what does that look like? What kind of scale does it occur on? And what does it mean for some of the paleo environmental controls? And number three is, what is weathering like in some of these aeolian deposits? Uh, what are some of the different patterns? And what do some of these patterns imply about the host rock properties as well as uh, climate conditions? So these three stories take place in Utah, the area that I've been studying. And so the first story of diagenesis is expressed in some of the Permian deposits, the White Rim sandstone, as well as in some of the Navajo sandstone that I'll talk about. Um, the second story of soft sediment deformation um, occurs in both the Navajo sandstone as well as a younger uh, Jurassic unit called the Carmel Formation. And then the third story about weathering also occurs in the Navajo sandstone, and these uh, outcrops occur in southern Utah. So there are going to be these three stories that I'm going to go through, or these little uh, vignettes. So the first story about diagenesis, um, colors are reflecting how iron has typically cycled through the Earth's crust. And in particular, some of these forms, um, concretions, these cemented mineral masses, record how fluids have moved through the rock and preferentially cemented um, some of these areas. So all of these uh, features are telling us about how groundwater has moved through the rock in the past. And so this is a three-step model that we've developed, one that the grains get an early iron oxide coat in its history. And then as these sediments are buried in the subsurface, waters, reducing waters come through, bleach the sandstone white, and put the iron into solution. And then uh, later on in the history, iron is reprecipitated upon oxidation into these concretionary uh, types of forms. So the iron goes from being very disseminated to being very concentrated. So the summary of this might uh, look like this movie here where we start off with red sandstone fairly early in the history. Reducing waters come through and bleach the sandstone white, putting the iron into solution so that these waters are saturated with Fe2+. And then later on, uh, oxygenated groundwater comes in. Uh, iron is reprecipitated. It's also possible that some of these could be uh, uh, iron um, concretion, something like pyrite, that gets precipitated and then later gets oxidized. So it's possible that some of these could have a precursor um, mineralogy. Now, in the Permian White Rim Sandstone of Canyonlands in southeastern Utah, this is an area that's known as the Tar Sand Triangle. And so there are some very rich um, tar deposits. And in particular, one of the most prominent formations containing the tar is called the White Rim Sandstone. And you can see uh, its expression and why it might get this name, White Rim. And this particular formation has the tar just literally oozing out of the outcrop. And this is an area where we can study the effect of hydrocarbons on the diagenesis because you can see that there is strong bleaching in this unit. And we've also recently discovered that there are also concretions in this same unit. So in Utah, this is the area of Canyonlands. You can see the cross-bedded sandstones that are aeolian in nature. And you can see the hydrocarbons just dripping and out of the outcrop. And in the same formation, you see some of these concretions. Some are small, like the round balls, and others are like these columns. And you can see the coloration is indicating the iron oxide. We've done some field mapping and looked at some of the permeability 
measurements using an in situ mini permeameter. We've also done a lot of petrography and even tried to identify whether you could see any signals of some of the past hydrocarbons in the rocks using gas chromatography. So here is the white room sandstone that's expressed here. And you can also see it here as the eolian unit that's often um, a cliff former right here, sandwiched in between some of these other rocks that show the red coloration above and also below. One of the things we've noticed about these particular deposits is that the um, fluids that move through often will produce coloration patterns that reflect some of the original host rock properties. So the original depositional structure is very important in exerting an influence on how fluids will migrate through the rock. So here you can see the Aeolian cross-bedded sandstones. Right here at this boundary, this is where there are horizontally reworked marine deposits on top of the Aeolian sediments. And you can see that the fluids have actually moved up through here and they reach this boundary right here and they stop. And that's telling us that the textures of these two rocks are very different and the fluids are very sensitive to those differences in the textures. So the message that's important here is that the host rock has a strong influence on how fluids will migrate through the rock. Another aspect that's very interesting is that many of these Aeolian reservoirs are often being considered as potential places to store CO2 or for CO2 sequestration. And it turns out that although many of these Aeolian deposits are good reservoirs, they're not perfect reservoirs that never leak out. They actually um, show evidence that sometimes uh, fluids can actually migrate out. So in this case, you can see the white rim sandstone right here. It's overlain by what was probably originally a red bed deposit of Triassic mudstones and some sandstones. And you can see that right at the top of the white rim, there's this area that's been bleached yellow. And maybe there's a lighter volatile stage that comes up through here. But you can see that this is not a perfect reservoir because some of the fluids actually leak out and actually show this bleaching envelope over the top of the white rim. So coloration is a good indicator of where the fluids have been in the past. So uh, from looking at this particular area, we can see that reservoir characterization allows us to distinguish some of the important characteristics of these facies. And many of these facies have very subtle differences in the permeability that reflect how a reservoir might be partitioned or how fluids might migrate through. In terms of the diagenesis, we see that there's a lot of complexities of how iron has moved through. But what's so important is that many of the colorations that we see in these units are reflecting how iron has cycled through, through the rock. And so this has applications to not only understanding hydrocarbons, where they're present and have done the bleaching, but also where they can leak out into some of the surrounding rock units. And this has implications if you're going to store CO2, it's really important to understand uh, where the fluids might uh, migrate and whether or not it's a, a got a good seal on it. A second story that I want to tell you about is soft sediment deformation. And surprisingly, not all of these uh, units just show normal cross bedding, but some show these fantastic features showing that the sediments were soft as they were um, deformed before they were actually lithified and turned into a hard rock. So the area that I'm going to show you is called White Pocket. Uh, white Pocket is really a tremendous exposure in three dimensions that's right here at the Utah-Arizona border. Um, so it's just inside the um, Arizona side. And nearby is an area that's called the Wave. And maybe many of you have seen pictures of the Wave on calendars or uh, photographers go there many times. This is the Navajo sandstone, and it's very highly sculpted. 
and people come from all over the world uh, to see this particular uh, area. But although this is the main uh, tourist attraction, it actually turns out that White Pocket is very close by and shows some features that I think are equally spectacular. So this area of White Pocket is more of the Navajo sandstone. And in this area, we wanted to get a different perspective than simply being on the ground. And we started this uh, a number of years ago using a remote controlled airplane and using some kites because it would give you a different perspective that's in between uh, being on the ground and using Google Earth. And we started this before many people started getting the quad copters and, and these popular um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that are being used now. But here we mounted cameras on this airplane to try to get a perspective of these um, outcrops and to help us do a better job of interpreting the geology. Now in these outcrops, you've got some very good cliff exposures of the Navajo sandstone, and you can see some of the coloration differences that are reflecting some of the changes in permeability. But in particular, we see that many of these outcrops show um, different facies, and typically they're arranged from undeformed sandstone going into deformed type of sets as you go in an upward direction. So here are the cross-bedded Aeolian sands that show the typical high angle dune cross stratification. And what you'll notice is that um, as you go upward, some of these dune sets start to show deformation and then go into uh, breccia facies up here at the top. So again, the, uh, the undeformed cross-bedded sandstone is overlain by deformed sandstone where many of these sets have been deformed. And these might be on the scale of meters to up to maybe 10 meters. And then on top of that, there's a breccia right around in here. And this has class of this underlying sandstone that have been incorporated uh, into this sandstone that shows the white bleaching. Now this particular sandstone is massive and it has no structure. And generally, massive sandstones are very difficult to find in the geologic record because um, you have to have special types of conditions. But here you've got this massive sandstone with these breccia blocks and literally these pieces had to be forcefully detached and entrained um, into this breccia to get this kind of pattern. So one of the questions is, why do we get these kinds of deformations and this breccia and how might they originate? So here are some examples of the breccia sandstone. You can see the underlying red sandstone here, and you can see some of these pieces that have literally been um, taken up from this underlying area and incorporated into the massive sandstone. Some of these still retain some of the original Aeolian laminations in them. So they were still, they were partially lithified, but, but not totally. And then here's the massive sandstone that's much like a blanket covering um, some of these deformed sets that you can see underneath here. And um, this kind of gives you an idea of what the scale is. And I'll talk a little bit more about this weathering pattern um, later on. So White Pocket was given its name because if you look at these aerial photos, you can see that it's very white where the sandstone has been bleached white. And this area on the right is enlarged from this block here. And what you'll notice is that even from these Google Earth images, you see these ridges that are aligned like this. And there's maybe about 12 of these ridges. And these are aligned from the northeast to the southwest. And what's um, unusual about these ridges is that they have a spacing that's maybe on the order of 40 to 60 meters. And the orientation of these mounds is directly perpendicular to the paleo flow direction of the dune sets. So the dunes would have been migrating towards the southeast, and these mounds are directly perpendicular to the paleo flow direction. Okay, so if we look to the south using these uh, remote controlled airplane cameras, you can see an image of this massive sandstone and you can see some of these ridges. And what's funny is these ridges almost look like um, 
like having a ball underneath a rug or something. They just kind of poke up here, and the, these are raised areas um, that show um, this unusual weathering pattern. Here's another example that shows from the aerial uh, photography. You can see some of these ridges that are shown here. You can see the deformation that's shown in these uh, original Aeolian sands. And so many of these mounds seem to be cored by dune sets that have been turned up and are actually kind of almost standing up on edge. So it's like the dune sets kind of punch up and, and you have this massive sand blanket that's uh, liquefied sand that's now been exposed uh, by the weathering. So perhaps some of the um, overlying units might have been, or even some of this red um, clay uh, sandstone might have been contributing to being a confining layer. But what you see is this unusual pattern of this massive sandstone uh, with the breccia that's shown in this expression here. Um, this is one of my favorite images that shows the scale of the deformation that's literally uh, tens of meters across. And I think seeing an image like this is fairly unusual um, in most outcrops. And so this is really fantastic. It's almost like somebody took an egg beater and just stirred up the um, sediment. And here's another example showing um, some of the soft sediment deformation here. And this would be part of the massive uh, sand blanket. And so this massive sand blanket seems to show evidence of being a product of liquefaction. And there must have been some um, induced ground failure that caused the, the sand stone, uh, the sand grains to liquefy and produce that massive blanket. So the model that we've come up with is uh, having large scale deformation in, an, in a dune field where there was relatively high water table. Maybe it wasn't always high. It could have been lower, and then something happened, and maybe during a strong ground motion, the water table rose. But as the water table rises and is close to the surface, this actually produces different liquefaction resistance. So where the dunes are piled up, it has high liquefaction resistance. Where the dune sets are thinner or where there's less load, this would have a, a lower um, liquefaction resistance. So you can see higher liquefaction resistance, lower liquefaction resistance, kind of alternating back and forth, which um, produces a particular pattern that is consistent with this idea of facilitating lateral spread and failure of the dunes. So during strong ground motion, you might shake up this area and actually kind of split the dunes so that with liquefaction, water is trying to escape. It actually kind of comes up here, and then you have liquefaction of some of this sand in this massive blanket that has some of the class that have been ripped up and incorporated into the breccia. So essentially, the, um, the sand is going through a transition to a steady state flow right where this orange part is here. And you're splitting some of the dunes, which might contribute to some of the mounds that you get. And it's destroying much of the original sedimentary um, structure. But one of the most important features of this is that in order to get this kind of liquefaction, you have to have a high water table and be relatively close to, uh, probably close to the surface. So if you think about this model, essentially what's happening is that the sediments are going through a process where they're experiencing cyclic mobility with um, strain. And as the strain increases, the strength of the sediment decreases. So you go down like this. And then eventually, you're reaching the steady state flow, which is reflected by this massive sand blanket. So this is showing very dynamic deformation where uh, water is uh, upwelling and actually deforming the sediment and actually eventually reaching the steady state flow to produce the massive sand. If you think about how could this happen, it, it would probably require very strong energy source. And one of the energy sources that might be likely is having earthquakes. 
And so much of this um, soft sediment deformation might be a reflection of past earthquakes in the geologic record. And people have done studies of liquefaction versus the distance from a earthquake center or the epicenter. And you can see um, the distance shown here across the horizontal axis with the uh, moment magnitude of earthquakes across the vertical axis. And in order to get the kinds of deformation that we're seeing, where we would likely be on the order of hundreds of kilometers away from probably a subduction zone during the Jurassic, you'd have to have an earthquake that's very strong, maybe close to a, a moment magnitude of eight or so in this field that's shown by the red to produce that scale of deformation. Now, it's also possible that maybe there could be something like a bolide impact that might have happened, but this is something that we don't have the direct evidence for as of yet. So uh, the scene that I want to leave you with is this idea of the scale of the soft sediment deformation. It really is impressive. And I had mentioned earlier about how we can use Earth examples to help interpret Mars. And so this next image um, shows you a superposition of a scene from some of the high-rise imagery from Mars. And you can see similar types of features that would suggest that there might also be strong ground motion and relatively high water table conditions to produce these features that look like soft sediment deformation on Mars. So the significance of these kinds of outcrops at White pocket are that it's really kind of rare to get this three-dimensional exposure that gives you a different view than what you would normally get just along a two-dimensional cliff face. Um, and we have some idea of time in this record to show that, that this um, is probably a new class of a geomorphic feature where you have these ridges that might be produced from um, seismites or from seismic action. So this has implication for liquefaction on Earth and in these dune fields, as well as possibly on Mars. And in particular, it's important to understand these types of features because it has implications for how modern and even ancient dunes uh, um, react and are affected by strong ground motion. Now, another example of soft sediment deformation are these unusual features that we call clastic pipes. And as you look at these, the, they almost look like trees um, sticking up, but these are pipes that are made of sandstone. And they're cylindrical, almost like a tree. And what you'll notice is that there's even some kind of a regular spacing to these types of features. And these are out of the Carmel Formation, which is a slightly younger formation than the Navajo that I was just showing you. Now, in this particular area, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at the density of the pipes and how they're distributed and what this means in terms of the paleo environment, and then trying to come up with a model to explain these and also recognizing that there's some implication for reservoirs as well as for perhaps understanding Mars. You can see this one a pipe here. It's slightly coarser sand than some of the surrounding host rock, which are uh, Sabka sand deposits. And you can see that there's even preferential bleaching um, th up through the pipe and in the area that's just surrounding the pipe there. So I have a student that's been looking at these pipes. He's actually measured and physically mapped them out. Um, he has a sample set of N equals 885, so almost 900 of these pipes. And there are many more that he could look at. But in this particular area, he was just trying to get an idea of what the distribution of these are. And you can see that they vary in size. Some of them are small, but maybe sort of an average is about 60 centimeters uh, in diameter. Some of them are larger. And these uh, tend to occur in an area in the paleogeographic reconstructions that was very close to the boundary between the dune field that lay towards the southeast. And then you can see a tongue of the ocean kind of coming down here. And this area of where the pipes are is parallel to the paleo shoreline. And there are a number of pipes in, in some of these areas that are aligned up. And so these seem to be very clearly related to uh, where the shoreline was and probably high water um, 
groundwater table conditions. One of the reasons why these um, pipes are important are these clastic injectites is that these have implications for reservoirs. And other colleagues have been doing studies on um, sandstone dikes and sills. These are shown by these colors here. And you can see that one of the important features is that many of these injectites can actually be conduits that might connect up sand bodies through normally um, impenetrable aquitards. So here are examples where you can see these channelized bodies, and you can see that these injectites would actually make conduits that actually can connect some of these uh, reservoir units. Some of the aspects that we're looking at is that there do seem to be the um, pipe geometries, and then some are the dike geometries that are more tabular. And why are you getting these uh, different types of shapes? We think it's possible that the pipes might be more common in the sandstones and the dikes that have the tabular geometries might be more common in shales. And this is something I think that will deserve further study to understand the implications for subsurface reservoirs. The significance then of these pipes that I've showed you is that these are related to high water table conditions. Uh, we think that these are related to the right kinds of lithologies and having sand that is um, available to be moved under pressure. Um, many of these sands have high porosity and permeability, and this can facilitate some of the liquefaction. And many of these uh, features seem to be reflecting strong ground motion. And you can see modern examples of sand blows. These are from the New Madrid fault zone in Missouri. And you can see that um, the strong ground motion has produced these features that are these sand blows uh, that are cored by probably some of these injectites. Um, and then some of these actually erupt out onto the surface, much like a sand volcano. In some of the Jurassic units, um, we're still trying to figure out whether they actually erupted onto the surface. But what's interesting is that in some of these units, and you can see some of the soft sediment, um, the syn sedimentary faulting that might be associated with the deformation, but there are some class that look like this pink one right here. And as you look at closely at that pink class, it's volcanic. And so what this is implying to us is that this might be a volcanic bomb that actually got thrown out of a volcano and uh, landed here in these Sabka sediments um, because, you know, there's no other grains around it that you would ex normally expect with other um, types of uh, river conditions or other types of features. So perhaps volcanism might be the driver for some of the strong ground motion that gets preserved and produces some of these pipes in the geologic record. So the implication that this might have for Mars, um, these are some images that one of my colleagues, Chris Okubo, has been working on. And there are some areas on Mars that seem to show these uh, features where there are dips that are slightly going away, and it seems to have a massive interior. And so these are maybe possible pipes of uh, large scales. Now, the third story I wanted to tell you about was weathering of some of these Aeolian sands. And we're going to go back to the Jurassic Navajo sandstone. And one of the prominent features in the park of Zion in southwestern Utah is called Checkerboard Mesa. And Checkerboard Mesa is given its name because it has cross bedding, and then it has these uh, vertical features that come across the face of it that make it look much like a checkerboard or checkerboard squares. Okay? And what you'll notice is that on the north side of the um, feature, the checkerboard pattern is fairly well developed. But if you just go around just to the west side, you'll see that the checkerboard pattern kind of disappears. So why would that pattern only be on, on one side of this particular knob? Well, if you look carefully, um, you'll see that there's some very striking uh, relationships. And what's interesting is that some people wondered if these could be um, joints that are cutting across this feature. But they're not joints because they don't go all the way through the rock, and you'll also see that the orientation of these cracks changes. 
So we're looking kind of up this north face. This is the cross bedding of the Aeolian sandstone right here, it's going, dipping off to the right. And here are these um, vertical types of cracks that are going radially down the face of this outcrop. And what you'll see is that these cracks always stay perpendicular to the cross bedding. And then where there's a place along the uh, bedding surface or on the lamina, it might offset where some of the stresses have been taken up. And then it kind of curves like this, offset, and stays perpendicular to the cross bedding. Okay, so these are weathering patterns that are being exhibited as a function of what the original host rock properties are. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Here you can see the cross bedding like this. You see the cross bedding is dipping to the left. And these are weathering cracks. And normally what you think is the weathering cracks should just take the shortest way down. And so you would think that the weathering cracks would just go straight down the face. But they don't. They actually kind of slightly change direction. And you see that they stay exactly perpendicular to the cross bed sets, and that means that it's actually at an angle to the, the straight vertical down direction. Okay, So what that means is that these rectilinear types of patterns, kind of like a checkerboard, are being controlled by the anisotropies of the cross bedding, the aeolian cross bedding. So this aeolian cross bedding produces enough anisotropy that's controlled by the grain size and perhaps the amount of clays that the um, weathering cracks actually develop perpendicular to that. Now, there are other types of um, crack patterns. And some of those crack patterns are, again, reflecting the differences um, in the host rock lithology. And it turns out that where the sandstone is massive and has been deformed, like some of the white pocket examples that I've showed you, the pattern that develops there tends to be polygonal. Okay. And so what you'll see is that um, I can tell what the host rock lithology is just by looking at the weathering pattern, even if I don't see um, the outcrop close up. So here's an example where you can see the um, checkerboard or this rectilinear pattern that develops where the sandstone is laminated. And then right up here along the same aspect, the same kind of slope outcrop, right in here the pattern changes to more polygonal. And this is where the sandstone is massive, right in here. And so the stresses are taken up differently where the sandstone is isotropic because it's massive. Here's another example where you can see the rectilinear cracks. Right in here is where the sandstone is disturbed. And you can see that the cracks kind of disappear right there. And so again, it's very much controlled by the original host rock and the depositional textures. So what we wanted to do was uh, understand this a little bit better and try to understand what are the controls of the facies or these original depositional structures. And so we decided that we would try to find a knob where some of these patterns are well developed. This one is particularly uh, pretty where you can see all these polygonal patterns that have developed. And they're almost kind of puffy looking, uh, almost like a cauliflower or something. And so what we wanted to do is try to get an idea of maybe the changes across an outcrop. So we took a, a knob that wasn't quite like that one that I showed you the last picture of, but it's very similar. So here's a knob here where we could look at all four sides, kind of the north side, the east side, the south face, and the west face that's on the back side there. And one of my students actually drilled some holes into the uh, outcrop at these particular localities on each face. And then what we wanted to do was put some probes, some temperature probes, into the outcrop to see if we could actually measure some of the changes that the rock might experience as it's undergoing weathering. So at this particular area, this is what the north face looks like, so where you can see that the weathering patterns are very well developed and show a lot of relief. On the east side, um, they also show the polygonal patterns, but the relief is not quite as high. On the south side um, the, and on the west side, the patterns are not very well developed compared to the north side and the east side. So um, what we did was we put these temperature probes in for about a year. 
and we wanted to measure microclimate changes over that uh, time span of a year where it measures them on a daily basis. And we were able to drill holes that were down about 30 centimeters and about um, uh, 5 uh, centimeters in diameter. Um, you could see the hole that's shown right here. And then we linked three of these temperature probes together, and we put these at distances so that they would be down at 10 centimeters depth, 20 centimeters depth, and a 30 centimeters depth. So we could actually see what changes um, do you see with uh, depth. So we put these on the north, east, and south, and west faces. So I'm going to show you some of the data from these different faces. You can see this is the time period covering a year uh, on the horizontal axis. And here is the temperature. Um, we should have put degrees C, but this is in Fahrenheit. And what you'll see is that during the fall, you can see that the temperatures are warmer. And then as you get into the winter time, the temperatures, particularly on the north face, actually get into this freezing zone right in here. And then you can see some of the temperature changes as you go up to the spring and the summer. Um, the, the red is showing you the shallow depths, and then this lighter color is showing you the deeper depths. But even on a daily scale, there's quite a bit of change, uh, temperature changes in these, and then getting into the freezing, and then again, all of these um, cycles that might be contributing towards the weathering. Now, for contrast, I'm going to show you the west face. And the west face you know, shows the same types of patterns on a daily type of signal. But what you'll notice is that during the winter time, the west face gets more sun. And so it doesn't get into those freezing um, regions that the north face did. So if I go back, uh, here's the north face, which shows these freezing temperatures down here. And here is the west face, which is much warmer. Okay. So these are factors that probably contribute to the weathering and might partially account for the weathering patterns and cracks being better developed on the north face. Another uh, feature that's interesting is that I mentioned that aeolian rocks could potentially be a host for life. And as we look at some of these outcrop exposures, you see that there's kind of a gray layer on top of these sandstones. And as you look more carefully and take a thin section, this um, is showing the upper part of the sandstone where it's gray here. And what this is showing is that there's cr uh, cryptoendolithic bacteria that are living within the pores of this sandstone and might be helping protect it from weathering or maybe even perhaps enhancing some of the weathering in some cases. So again, there seems to be a interesting relationship between uh, life and how it interacts with some of the substrate or some of these aeolian host rocks. So the significance of these weathering cracks is that it's fairly distinctive in this particular desert landscape. And many of the controls on the weathering patterns are probably related to what the original host rock lithology is, where the anisotropies are versus whether or not it's isotropic from being massive. And sometimes the um, aspect that it's on and the slope angle might contribute to these patterns. And probably even microclimate changes are happening even over a yearly scale where there's different moisture content that might be affecting the weathering pattern. And some of this is probably representing time. Uh, probably the deeper these cracks are, the more time is represented. And even biology and microbial or um, bacterial life might be important in some of these particular patterns. So these uh, are probably a combination of features that are complex, but really reflect some of the changes in, in even the modern uh, desert environment uh, of these host rock lithologies. So to summarize these three stories that I told you, number one on diagenesis, um, the bottom line here is that the colors are reflecting how iron has cycled through the rock and is reflecting uh, different periods of diagenesis. Um, in particular, uh, some of these units show hydrocarbons, and the presence of the bleaching might be an exploration tool to tell where the hydrocarbons have been, like this area up here. 
And um, many of the diagenetic histories are probably complex. It shows that there are concretions, but maybe even some of these are biomediated by some of these hydrocarbons that might have been present. Um, the second story of soft sediment deformation, I think, uh, show that there are many different types of forms from uh, pipes like these types of features to um, large scale, massive uh, uh, sand blankets to these kinds of deformation patterns. Um, and the scales can go from centimeters that are small uh, all the way up to perhaps kilometers, uh, maybe even some of these larger uh, scales might occur on Mars. And these types of soft sediment deformation features are reflecting conditions of the paleo environments where sand is susceptible to deformation when there's strong ground motion and liquefaction occurring. And then the third story was about weathering in these aeolian deposits. And you see that there are different kinds of weathering expressions that are a function of um, massive host rocks giving these polygonal types of patterns to the uh, rectilinear patterns being produced where there's anisotropies of the cross beds. And maybe even many of these um, particular features of slope and aspect, microclimate and the amount of moisture might greatly influence how these patterns develop and perhaps even with a biological component. But these are features that are often distinctive of um, the desert southwest in the U.S. Uh, what's going to happen in some of our future studies? We're still looking at diagenesis in these Aeolian sandstones. And in Nevada, uh, you can see some very prominent color changes from this pink to this bright red to a bleach pattern here, kind of stepping up um, over a large outcrop scale. And many of these pink sandstones here show this very complex patterns of almost like candy stripe uh, types of features where it's red and white. And these are very complex. I'm not sure what the origins of those are, but we're exploring those um, further. And I mentioned a little bit that we're using some of this um, helium chronometry to try to tell us something about the um, ages. And so typically these radioactive parents go into these radiogenic daughters and can produce some helium. And you can measure some of these amounts of helium to give some idea of dates. And some of the iron oxides that we've been looking at seem to have uh, ranges that are relatively young from 25, even as young as uh, 0.1 million years. So there seems to be a big range. Um, and some of these might be reflecting some of the young waters that have passed through there. Um, this shows some of the other patterns um, that are, are quite distinctive. You can see some of this red and white um, pattern that's parallel to the cross bedding. But you can also see some of the concretions that are shown by these areas here. And I thought this picture was fascinating because you can see that there's lichen that have um, preferentially uh, attach themselves to some of the areas where the concretions were. And I'm not sure if they liked it there because it's dark and it might uh, retain more heat or if it's because of some of the iron that's there. But um, again, there seems to be a relationship between life uh, and the geology. So I think there's lots of areas of exploration still ahead in some of these Aeolian deposits. And there's a, a popular song um, in, the, in the U.S. that um, says, it's a song that's called Blowing in the Wind. And one of the refrains is that the answer is blowing in the wind. And I think there's many answers that are still left there. Um, and I think that these uh, Aeolian deposits do contain some fascinating records that are very different than what we've previously uh, been able to decipher. So that is the Aeolian story. Uh, I thank you for listening. And I want to just briefly mention that Geological Society of America is meeting in Vancouver. And uh, that's, that's a convenient place uh, for uh, travel from Asia. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. OK, now is open to the questions and comments. 
uh, questions, some questions on the uh, seven deformation. And how, how thick is that deformation zone in, in the maximum case? Um, it seems to be on the order of maybe a few tens of meters, around 10 plus meters. Um, and it seems to be variable. It's not always a consistent thickness. Sometimes it seems uh -huh. to be uh, thicker, and then other places it almost seems to be relatively thin. So uh -huh. I think it's variable. And it might be a function of you know some of the different conditions, what the w what the confining layer was, and what its distribution was as well. So it, it w within the one one event of the deformation that the thickness changes laterally. Yes, it can change laterally. So is that the deformation zone um, uh, heterogeneous or homogeneous in terms of velocity and permeability that is critical in particular materials? The deformation compared to the undeformation zone? Um, let's see. Uh, well, which is homogeneous, which is better than uh, as, um, as the reservoir rock? I, as a reservoir rock, I would think that the um, places where it's a massive sandstone, where it's been liquefied, would be a very interesting target area um, because it's so homogeneous. Whereas in the cross-bedded sandstones, there's, um, there's an anisotropies of the individual lamina where there's different grain sizes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's more homogeneous where you have the, the liquefaction. So you have your option zone is more, more homogeneous, mm -hmm. better uh -huh. as a result. And you know, maybe even some of the fluids that have migrated up, uh, maybe they're dispersing or changing the distribution of clay minerals that are usually the, the aquitards or the ones that are kind of hard to get past in terms of the permeability for, for fluid movement. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Please. So I like the big function of the um, It's possible to have an earthquake of magnitude 708, even at modern time. So have you ever seen the modern analog? Um, have you seen the modern? possibilities in South America where the, it's very dry to develop the human field and they likely to have a big earthquake. Yeah. Right? I think that's a good question. And um, this came up because uh, I was at, um, when I was in New Zealand, there is an area of Christchurch that experienced a large earthquake. And they had, um, they had sand, sand volcanoes and, and that type of thing, but they're fairly small. Yeah. And so one question is, they had a very big earthquake. Why didn't they get these big uh, pipes and, uh, and sand volcanoes, and they just had these little ones. Well, I think a lot of it is a function of uh, many complex features like what the paleo environment was, how much sand there was, and in this particular setting in Christchurch, it's a marginal marine type of environment. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, it's difficult to always make a comparison, um, and it might depend on you know, what the paleo environment was, how much water was available. Uh, I think there's just a lot of, of factors, what the confining layers are like. Um, but it, it would be interesting if you could find a dune field that was uh, in an area that experienced a large earthquake. But to my knowledge, there, there aren't any places where we see those currently in the modern environment. So you think it was probably significant find it? Yeah, do you have an example? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it would be interesting. Um, but I, I think also as populations are expanding into areas that they weren't before, um, you know, it, uh, it, it could be an issue where um, people are building in areas that might be susceptible to liquefaction. Right. And so I think it does help. The, the geologic record does help us understand what some of the expressions could be. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's some strange things that I've seen in Southern California, Salton Sea down through Baja area mm -hmm. that, that some people have attributed to earthquake. Uh -huh. and, and so that might be 
Of course, that's where the San Andreas Fault is. And yeah. Dune fields and things going through there. Although right. it has been, you know, strongly affected by modern irrigation, mm -hmm. pumping, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. But yeah. it might be, might be possible. Yeah. Um, related to this kind of a question, I'm not sure what is the duration of the Navajo thunderstorm, but do you have several horizons which are characterized by that kind of a deformation, or just one horizon? That's a good question. Um, are there multiple horizons, or is there just one horizon? There's this one horizon that seems to be remarkably large, but there does seem to be other horizons, and, and also in these clastic pipes, there seem to be multiple horizons. And we can see places where um, you know, the pipes exist and then the, there'll be a boundary and they stop and then they, they might skip a couple layers and then there'll be some other layers above where their pipes kind of occur again. So that seems to suggest to us <coughs> that, that there are multiple periods of, of liquefaction and probably from earthquakes. And for some reason you had the right conditions where the water table was fluctuating enough and you had the right porosity and permeability that you were getting the preservation of these at, at multiple intervals. Yeah. I think in Japan, the large earthquake uh, expected to occur every southern year, two thousand years. Someone is very familiar with this sort of uh, events. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Possibly yeah. during the Jurassic time. Right. <laughs> it's hard to, and these, the dating is so difficult, it's hard to know what the recurrence interval is on a year scale. But seem to be multiple times. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? There's <coughs> yes, maybe a paleo example. In the Transvaal Supergroup in Southern Africa, uh, there's a banded ironstone, I forget the exact name of it, but there's a unit, well, usually it's very nicely bedded, but at one point in the stratigraphy it goes crazy. And it's then truncated by normal bits on top of that. And that one unit is traceable from Swaziland all the way over into uh, Botswana. And, and, and the only interpretation anybody's ever given it, and maybe it's a big seismic event that liquefied just the top of the bifs that were not very liquefied. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Sounds so reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe an impact structure. <laughs> That's possible too, but usually for impacts, people want that smoking gun and they want to know, yeah. see all the other evidence. Yeah. So any other questions? I have one more quick question. Okay. You showed us the modern weathering processes. Uh-huh. Are there any similar patterns on Mars? Oh, yes. And I, I guess I didn't show that, but um, there seem to be some features on Wapme Rock, which was uh, one of the images um, it's, it's a sulfate-rich rock, but it also seems to show this polygonal pattern that's over the, the top of the rock. Um, and, you know, it's important to distinguish what, what's a weathering pattern and actually goes along the exposed surface versus something like mud cracks, which would be confined or constrained to bedding planes. Yeah. And it, it did seem like there was a, a weathering pattern. Okay, very interesting. So, any, are there any other questions? If there are no more questions, so I want to close this uh, Professor Chan's lecture meeting by thanking to uh, Professor Chan as well as to you all of the participants. So thank you very much for very nice Thanks. chat. <laughs> and I just want to remind you that uh, we will have a reception. So, um, whenever we're ready, you can take the elevator down, go to the first floor. When you come out of the elevator, on the left side, there's a little entryway. Just go in there, and it'll be in that area. So I think uh, we will join to the uh, regular your event mm -hmm. called uh, Happy Friday. Hour. <laughs> well, we have... Yeah. Is, is it and Elsie. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope you, you all try to attend this reception. I think it's a good opportunity for you to exchange your science with uh, Professor Chan and also the other staff of this institute, as well as some um, Japanese people from the uh, different uh, companies and the institute and the university. Okay, thank you very much for joining thank us. You.